And while there's a weightiness to Memorial Day, um, it's also the unofficial start of summer, and it certainly feels like it um, this weekend. And I just want to tell you at the beginning of our time, I am um, sort of oddly excited about this summer. Um, In general, at the risk of being a little bit of a killjoy, summer is not usually my favorite. Right? I hate being hot. I burn really easily. Uh, the kids being off school for two and a half months kind of is a joy and a blessing. Uh, but it also messes with all of my little carefully constructed rhythms and routines and all of these things that I lean into for a sense of well being. And sometimes I roll into the summer with a like, all right, let's just grin and bear it. Let's just get through this thing. And then cool weather and school will be here soon. Soon, but if I'm completely honest, there is a sense of anticipation in my heart for this summer, both for my family and for our church. So what we are going to do today is take a one-week break from the series of messages that we've been doing, walking through the book of Acts that we're calling Convergence, and talk about what I believe God wants to do in our church this summer. So kind of think about this as like a little micro vision message for June, July, and August. And this is something that John Michael and I have been talking about and processing and praying through. And part of the reason that I was tapping John Michael into that conversation is not just because I love and respect him, but because I was a little surprised by what was starting to rise up in my heart as I thought about this summer for our church. Because to be honest, my normal go-to for the summer, particularly over like the last five years, would be to try to uh, chart some sort of vision that is about rest. Right? This would be the time to talk about vacation or the spiritual benefit of play, the importance of sleep, Sabbath, margin, living life at a sacred pace, you name it. Right? That the summer is just about like, oh man, we're exhausted. Let's try to get some rest and go on vacation. And I'm not turning a blind eye to the fact that some of us in the room really are exhausted. We'll talk about that in a minute. But as I was kind of coming into this, maybe even with an expectation that the vision for the summer was just to get a deep breath, I felt like the Lord kept leading me back to a very different place in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 7 and 8. Rather, train yourself in godliness, for the training of the body has limited benefit. But godliness is beneficial in every way, since it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. I believe that God is inviting us to use this summer as an intentional season of training in godliness, which, if you think about it, means that this Sunday sermon is not really much of a break from what we've been talking about in Acts, presence, formation, mission. Formation is this idea of being formed into the image and likeness of Jesus. And when we talk about training in godliness, that's really just another way of talking about formation. That's really just another way of talking about becoming more like Jesus. But I think the idea of training is so helpful for us because it forces the conversation to go in the direction of taking specific action to accomplish specific goals, right? Let me see if I can illustrate the comparison for you. If I were to stand up here and tell you, hey, y'all, one of the things I'm hoping to do this summer is to get in, like, slightly better shape. You'd be like, okay, good. That sounds great. Like, I don't really know what that means, but, like, yeah, go for it. That sounds fine. If, on the other hand, I told you, all right, this is hypothetical, by the way. This is not happening. But if I told you, like, I am going to use this summer to train for a half marathon that I am running in October, that would create a very different set of expectations, right? This is like generalized, aspirational, like, yeah, yeah, man, you go for it. I don't even know what it means. But if I tell you I'm training for a half marathon, 
I mean, that's like, oh, there's going to be like a running plan, for some nutrition thing. You're going to pay attention to hydro. There's like all kinds of things that are going to happen, and there's a date on the calendar. And you're, I mean, just feels like a very different experience. And the reason I'm making that point is I think a lot of times when it comes to our relationship with God, we settle for sort of the vague aspirational, right? Like, I just want to be like closer to Jesus. I just want to be like a better Christian. I just, you know nicer person, I don't know, something that's, that's, that's vague, that feels good, that everybody in your community group is going to be like, oh yeah, bro, you should go for that. That sounds fantastic. But if we were to take that vague, generalized idea and say, no, let's put it in the context of training, that would cause each one of us to ask some very specific questions about our life and what it is that God is asking us to do this summer to bring about very specific and very particular results in our lives. And I think that's where we need to be willing to go this summer. In order to help us get there, though, I want to use today to paint a picture of what does it look like to train in godliness. Right, because that's the trick. If I told you, man, I want to train for a half marathon, that's not hard to figure out, right? You can Google like half marathon training plan, five months prep time, and you will have a litany of different options. You download that sucker, you run how far you're supposed to go, when you're supposed to go, you do it, and you really will be able to get through the half marathon. Training and godliness were a little bit more like, yeah, man, probably read the Bible, come to church, I got it, like all the stuff. But I want to try to press that a little bit um, more specific, a little bit deeper. And the way we're going to do that is by following Paul's argument into the next section of 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 14 to 16. This is a picture of what it looks like to train in godliness. Don't neglect the gift that is in you. It was given to you through prophecy with the laying on of hands by the council of elders. Practice these things, be committed to them, so that your progress may be evident to all. Pay close attention to your life and your teaching. Persevere in these things. For in doing this, you will save both yourself and your hearers. Now, these are words that come from the Apostle Paul to his son in the faith, a guy named Timothy, who at this point is serving as a young pastor, a young church planter. So it feels like very specific instruction to Timothy about what it looks like to train for godliness in his life, but we can take these ideas and extrapolate them to all of our lives, and I think the way that it's most helpful to do that is actually to work our way through the passage kind of in reverse order, starting in verse 16 and working our way back, because in verse 16, we find this very clear instruction. We find this very clear command to pay attention. Right? Your translation probably says to pay close attention or to pay careful attention to your life and your teaching. Now, it's not at all surprising that Paul is instructing this young pastor, preacher, church planter to pay careful attention to his teaching. Right? That's a big part of what Timothy does to serve the church, right? That's just the spiritual equivalent of writing to a young doctor like, hey, pay really careful attention to the surgery or something like that. We're like, well, yeah, you want to get that right. Like, hey, Timothy, if you're going to stand up there and teach God's word, try to do that well. Right? We put a lot of attention on that, but then we very quickly read over this, like, pay careful attention to your life because we assume that all Paul means there is, oh, and by the way, just stay out of trouble. Like, just don't do anything really stupid that's going to disqualify you from being a pastor, get you tossed out of ministry, cause people not to listen to you. You know, just don't be, don't do anything dumb. But like, man, get up there and preach a good sermon. See, the problem is, Paul would have known the Greek words for don't do anything stupid. Like, he knew how to say that. Like, he would be like, if that's what I meant to say, I would have said, hey, Timothy, don't be an idiot. And go preach a really good sermon. But he doesn't say that. He says, Timothy, I want you to pay close attention to your life. Right? In any other context, if I said, hey, I want you to pay close attention to something, you would assume that I was asking you 
to be unusually curious, to be unusually observant, right? To be really focused on what's going on. And what if we took that same sense of curiosity and focus and observation and started to pay attention to what was happening in our actual lives, right? It is so simple, but it is also so elusive in this day and age, right? Anybody that thinks seriously about what it looks like to follow Jesus in this moment is well aware that one of the greatest spiritual dangers you and I contend with every single day is a limitless stream of distractions, right? You can be distracted by what's happening on Instagram. You can be distracted by what's happening on YouTube. You can be distracted by what's happening on TikTok. You can be distracted by what's happening in the news. You can be distracted by what's happening in other people's lives. We just call that gossip. Um, like, we can be distracted by all kinds of things. You can be distracted by what your cousin is up to. You can be distracted by all of this stuff. And what it does is give us a limitless sea of of things that we can focus on, a limitless sea of things that we can talk about, that we can engage with, all of which are designed to capture our attention for whatever purposes they want our attention. But in terms of the spiritual life, it means that your attention is certainly not on yourself and certainly not on what God is doing in this moment. Right Before we can even begin to train in godliness, we need to learn how to pay close attention to our lives. So I want to give you three very specific ideas. We'll do it quickly of what it looks like to pay attention to your life. Right? And I tried to phrase them in a way that would grab your attention and maybe even sound a little surprising to some of us depending on our background. Starting with, you need to learn how to pay attention to your body. Right, I, I can give you an illustration of exactly what I mean by that. Um, last Sunday, I was at home. Um, Sunday evenings are a pretty relaxed time in my world. It's pretty chill. Like, I love this. This is my favorite day of the week. I really do look forward to seeing all of you people. This is, like, not something I need to get through so I can get on to the good part. Like, I love this. But there's also a sense of, like, all right, I want to get this right. Like, I want to try to remember my notes. I want to serve you well. And by Sunday night, I'm just kind of like, well, that's as close to happy-go-lucky as I get um, uh, on Sunday night, right? Just kind of like, relax, chill. Life is, life is good. Um, hanging out in the living room, Laura came in, and she asked me uh, what would have been a totally benign question. Like, it was based on a text message she had gotten. If anything, she was just relaying uh, what you would consider like an offer to help. Like, it was somebody trying to do something nice for our family, but because of like some things in my world and some relational history and a bunch of stuff, um, I noticed that the simple question that Laura asked me, I go from like relaxed, chill John to like tense John in about 33 and a half seconds, right? Like I can just feel breathing shortening, shoulders tightening. I go from chill to agitated through one simple question. It had nothing to do with Laura. It had everything to do with me. Now, we don't tend to pay attention to that in the Christian life, right? Because we know that God speaks to us primarily through his word, which is true. And we know that God speaks to us through his spirit, which is true. But that leads us to believe that God is inherently out there trying to get our attention. And we need to focus out there to see what God wants to do in our life. We're looking for the modern day equivalent of a burning bush. Yet, scripture teaches very clearly that we are now temples of God, that you are a temple of the Holy Spirit, that the third person of the Trinity lives inside of you. So in terms of discerning the voice of God, in terms of paying attention to what God's doing, in terms of all of these things, in some ways the project is less, oh, God's out there, hi, I'm over here, what do you want to do in my life? And sometimes it's a lot more of like, hey, I'm inside of you. Maybe you need to pay attention to the fact that you went from super chill to hyper agitated so quickly. Maybe there's some relational things here that you need to pay attention to. Right? You, you see what I'm saying? That's what I mean by pay attention to your body. 
right? Pete Scazzaro is a pastor and author in New York City um, who loves to say that your body is a major prophet, not a minor prophet. Right? It's when you pay attention to your physical body that you discover that you're exhausted, that you're anxious, that you're stressed. Again, I'm not trying to sweep that under the carpet at all for the summer. We actually want to talk about what does it look like to deal with that. Right? If you're going to pay attention to your body, you might as well just keep going and pay attention to your emotions because, in a sense, they're one and the same thing. You feel your emotion in your physical body. Right? For some of us, that means acknowledging that you actually do have emotions. I was just for the guys in the room. We're girls. You're caught up. Um, the men aren't laughing because they're nervous. They're like, I have them, but I don't want to talk about them. Don't do it. Um, I'm like, you do have them, and we should talk about them, and we should actually be able to put specific names around them. Probably the one book that I recommend more than any other um, in a sort of pastoral counseling setting is a book by Chip Dodd called The Voice of the Heart. And what Chip does is he says, argues that there are eight primary Emotions. Different people have different numbers, some seven, five, twelve. Chip picks eight. And so much of what I am trying to do when I recommend that book to people is to say, hey, I just want you to know what these are, be able to put a name to them, and pay attention to when they show up in your life. If you're curious, they're hurt, lonely, sad, angry, afraid, shame, guilt and gladness, right? We tend to just say like, oh, I feel gladness. I understand that one. That's happy. I know that. Fleeting, but I've experienced it. And then I feel bad, right? I have happy and bad. Or maybe some of us are like, I have happy and angry and then bad. Well, there's a really big difference between, man, I just feel lonely right now. Man, every time I get off the phone with my mom, what I feel is sadness. Man, I, it's not that I feel angry about what my boss said. Like, I feel hurt. That's actually what's going on. I'm not ticked off. I'm hurt. Right? If we're able to pay that kind of attention to our life, it opens up a world of possibility for training and godliness. The third thing is to pay attention to your relationships. Right? How, how are things going between you and your friends, you and your spouse, you and your kids? What are some of the relational desires and longings that you have, right? If you you really want to get your money out of a good date night, um, sit down and ask your spouse, hey, what has it been like to be married to me for the last six months? Some of us are like, "Mm." so that... Or we could just go watch a movie and not talk at all. Like, the movie sounds fun. Let's do that. But man, can you think about what it opens up the door to? If we said, no, for real, I would like to know, what has it been like to be married to me for the last six months? Right? You don't need to be, like, cruel about your answer, but I want you to be honest. See, we avoid questions like that. But because we avoid questions like that, we're left in this vague, like, I don't know, I'll just read the Bible a little bit more. Pay close attention to your life because it will show you where you need to train for godliness, right? Now, this is where we're going to kind of keep moving into the second idea, which we come to in verse 15, that we need to practice these things. We need to be committed to them so that your progress may be evident to all, right? Part of the reason that we don't pay attention to our lives is, number one, we're terrified of what we're going to find, right? It's much easier just to live life tracking other people's journey on Instagram rather than, like, dealing with our physical, emotional, relational world. But part of the reason we're terrified of what we're going to find is we don't know what to do with the things that we discover, right? That's what actually holds us back. It's less the fear of what we will find. It's more specifically the fear of finding something that we don't know how to respond to, that we don't know what to do with it. And that's where Timothy or Paul is going to start to help us go in this verse by giving us some tools to deal with 
what we find as we pay close attention to our lives. But again, Paul's vision is that whatever we do, it's going to feel like, it's going to look like training in godliness. It's going to look like practicing certain things over and over again. Um, Pastor Craig Rochelle pastors a really large church in Oklahoma City, and he loves to make a big difference, a big deal about the difference between training and trying. Right? This is a verse about training. Craig says it this way. He says, to try is, attempt, is to attempt to do the right thing by exerting effort in the moment. To train is to commit to developing strategic habits that equip you to do the right thing in the moment. Again, quick analogy, right? I was a swimmer in grade school through high school and all that kind of stuff. And pools are open, so we really could do this, although I really don't want to. If you brought me to a pool today and we're like, hey, buddy, you're going to swim a hundred butterfly. I, I think I could do it. And by do it, I mean survive. <laughs> Not drown. I guarantee you it would be ugly. And I guarantee you, you would be nervous for at least the last 25 or 50. But I think I could get through it. Like I could hold it together, right? That's trying. That's just showing up at the pool and be like, I don't know, let's go swimming and see how it goes. It'll either work or it won't. And either way, you know, tomorrow's a new day. Training would be the, more the equivalent of like, hey, John, in the middle of August, you're going to have to swim 100 fly. I'd be like, oh, I could do it. Absolutely, I could be ready to do that. One is about effort in the moment. One is about developing strategic habits that equip you to do the right thing when the moment comes. Again, makes sense in the world of athletics, harder to deal with in the spiritual world. And I, I want to try to call us to this, though, in two different ways. If you were here a couple weeks ago, um, as we were walking through uh, the book of Acts, we got to Acts chapter 2, verse 46. So it said, described the early church this way. It said, every day they devoted themselves to meeting together in the temple, and they broke bread from house to house. Right? And at the time I said, hey, that's because there are some things in the spiritual life that are sort of sermon conversations, you know, kind of one on many. And then there's a lot of things in the spiritual life that are more table conversations, you know, community group setting, getting together and kind of working this out with people who know you, right? So I'm going to try to give you a sermon answer of what does it look like to practice this, these things, but also encourage you to have a table conversation about this with other followers of Jesus, right? Because the sermon version of like, okay, I get it. Again, you know, you got to swim a hundred butterfly. You're going to do certain things. I understand that. What do I do in the spiritual life? And my attempt to construct a one size fits all answer is Lord willing popping up on the screen right now. Look at that. It worked. Um, this chart is a little bit influenced by uh, John Mark Comer and the work he's doing at Practicing the Way, Adele Calhoun, Dallas Willard. Uh, John Ortberg's probably part of this somewhere, somehow, some form. Um, and there's a lot of just what I've learned over the last couple of years. But this is my attempt to say, okay, as you pay attention to your life, left-hand column, you should start to sense some things. And there's different things up there that you might become aware of right? Hopefully there's a fairly logical connection between the things that you start to sense in your soul and the things that you need in your life. I will also say if you're in a season where you're like, look, I don't even know what I sense. Well, number one, that's probably emptiness. But number two, if you're like, man, I don't know what I sense. I'm just not good at this. Maybe one of those needs registers for you. Right? Either way, there's a, there's a relationship between sense and need. And what I wanted to do was, in some cases, very obviously, if you feel exhausted, you need rest, and Sabbath is the spiritual discipline that corresponds to that. Right? But there's all of these different disciplines that we get through the New Testament. 
right? We have this idea that we might, might sense greed in our hearts. We might sense materialism in our hearts. We might sense comparison in our hearts. And we think we're just going to kind of pray that away somehow. Lord, make me a more generous person. But really what we are needing to do is to allow the Lord to sen- cultivate a sense of contentment in our souls, which again, we're like, all right, I'll just read verses about contentment. And I'm like, you should. First Timothy 6 is great. Keep going. There's all kinds of verses in the Bible about contentment. But the way that you break free of the trap of greed and comparison is through generosity. Right? It's, it's generosity with your money, with your time, with your words, with your encouragement. Generosity with inviting people into your home, that's how you break the stranglehold of greed. So what I wanted to do is put something up there that you could take a look at and say, hey, as I pay attention, I'm going to discover some stuff, I'm going to become aware of some needs, and wait a minute, these spiritual disciplines are not just good things that we're supposed to do to make God happy. Not at all. They are gifts that God has given us to enable us to taste and see his goodness and to open up our lives to his grace because at the end of the day, it is the grace of God that transforms us. That's what fasting is about. It's about breaking the chains of addiction and the things that enslave us and cultivating a sense of self-control. And it's really weird how skipping a meal or skipping two meals cultivates a sense of self-control that may not just help you in your relationship with food, but could also help you in your relationship with YouTube. And it sounds crazy. You're like, wait, what? You're telling me if I were to cultivate a practice of fasting, I would be less ensnared by the trap of YouTube? And I'm like, oh, that's exactly what I'm telling you. You should try it. You're going to be amazed at the way God uses that in your life. So there's the attempt to sort of do a one-size-fits-all fly by. Now, you can also imagine why it's helpful, though, to take that and press it into some very specific areas, right? If you're going to run a half marathon, you'd be really specific. If you're going to swim 100 fly, you'd be really specific, right? So Laura and I have started the process of saying, well, what does this look like in our family, right? And one of the things we do sense is not exhaustion in a like, oh my goodness, I'm going away sometime soon, like, you know, but like a tiredness, like a tiredness that comes with three wonderful kids and a really busy school year, just tiredness. So we've made some like intentional changes to our schedule um, over the summer to try to get, this is gonna sound so lame, but welcome to life in your 40s. We're working really hard to get an extra 30 to 45 minutes of sleep every day. And I could not be more excited about that. Like, it has taken intentionality because I'm not giving up time with God. And there's other non-negotiables um, that are going to happen that we really are working on how to be able to do that because that feels spiritually important, right? We're going to do a little screen detox as a family where we just take a big old step back from all things, you know, digital um, for at least the month of June just to kind of like reset and recalibrate some things in our heart because we sense like, man, that's part of what we need as a family. That's part of of training in godliness for our family. It's hyper-specific, right? My prayer is that you'll invest some time this week to come up with the hyper-specific answers for your family, not based on a sense of guilt and shame, not based on like, oh, I should do this, but based on the invitation of the Spirit of God. What do you need over this summer to train in godliness, right? As you do that, I hope you fall in love with Jesus all over again. I hope that you fall in love with the gift of the church over and over again. And I pray that you discover the gift that God has given you for the good of the body of Christ. Because that's verse 14. Don't neglect the gift that is in you. It was given to you through prophecy with the laying on of hands by the council of elders. We're going to come back um, after we finish up Convergence um, and get back in 1 Corinthians. And we're going to spend a lot of time this summer, 1 Corinthians 12, 13, 14, talking about spiritual gifts, talking about the things that God has enabled you to do for the good of the body of Christ. So I'm not going to say a lot about this, but part of this idea of training in godliness Right? It's not just an internally focused, oh, what's going on in my world? Oh, how can I get patched up and made healthy and whole? That's important. you got to do that. But ultimately, the goal, the trajectory of the Christian life 
is not to stay in a self-focused place, but to become an others-focused kind of person. That ultimately, as we train in godliness, we cultivate an ability to take our eyes off of ourselves a little bit more and start to look around at other people in the church, at other people in our neighborhood, at other people in our community, and ask, hey God, what are you asking me to do to be a part of bringing your kingdom to this city? What are you asking me to do to bring healing and grace and restoration to people in my family? God, what role do I play in this body to contribute and to help make this community as vibrant and vital and filled with life as it possibly can be? Right? Sometimes people will come and ask me, hey, where do we need, as a church, where do we need people to serve the most? And I'm like, hey, th- this is the fun part of being a smaller church. We need people to serve anywhere and everywhere. Um, wherever you look, we need help. And I don't mean that in like some sort of desperation thing. I mean it to reshuffle the conversation. We need help in kids. We need help in connect. We need musicians. We need help with people that want to lead out in a prayer ministry. We need help with people that want to lead community groups. We need, we need help with people that want to lead in partnerships with middle schools. You want to run a soundboard. I mean, you name it. We need help. So here's the question. What would bring you the most life? Right, kind of forget our needs as a church for a minute. What would you be excited to do on a Sunday morning? What would you be excited to do on a Wednesday night? Where would you feel like, man, I'm doing one of the things that God has created me to do, and I find joy and life in this, right? Because that's the idea that Paul is getting at in verse 14. Don't neglect the gift that is in you. Part of training in godliness is to reawaken that gift. It's part of how you come alive as a follower of Jesus. At the end of the day, training is about preparation. And I think the elders and I have this growing sense of anticipation and excitement for what we hope God will do in our church this fall. Right? We know that ultimately whatever it is that God chooses to do through our church, he does it by his grace. Certainly not a reward for our effort or our worthiness. It's all about him and his desire to make himself known to us and to our city. And God moves by grace, but he also moves when a church is ready. And to get ourselves ready, not for a half marathon or a hundred butterfly, but to get ourselves ready for God to move in a powerful way this fall. It means a season of training over the summer. You got to figure out around your table what that looks like for your family, what that looks like for you, what that looks like for you and your housemates. But I want to call you to it because I don't think you'll be disappointed if you lean into that over the course of the summer. Father in heaven, we want to come to you now. And Jesus, I am asking that you, by the power of your spirit, We'll just begin the work of speaking into each one of our hearts right now. God, that you would give us not in any way a sense of burden or obligation, but a sense of excitement. A sense that we could really become more like you over the summer. What that would look like, what that would feel like. To not be lonely, to be anchored in community. To not be flailing around, but be learning from your word. Jesus, I pray that you'd fill our hearts with a sense of excitement and joy. I pray this in Christ's name. Amen.